Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Nancy Hendrickson. Hi Nancy. Hey Joanna, how are you? I'm good and it's lovely to finally meet you. Uh, just a little introduction for everyone listening. Nancy, okay. <laughs> sorry. Nancy is a non-fiction author of nearly 30 books ranging from genealogy and history to books and courses for writers and creative entrepreneurs. And today we're talking about her book, The Visual Writer, How to Use Images to Spark Creativity. But Nancy, let's just start by you telling us a little bit more about you and your writing background. Oh, I'd love to. You know, I've heard so many authors interviewed who say, I've, I've written stories since I was a little kid. I always wanted to be a writer. If I can't write, I'd be miserable. I've never been, that has never been me. <laughs> I'm I, so glad you said that. <laughs> it has never been me. I always, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an archaeologist. That was my absolute passion. And when I got into college, what I realized was being an archaeologist means digging into things and finding out stuff. And that is a perfect background for a nonfiction author because I love knowing about stuff. I love asking questions. So what I found is that, you know, in college, I'm a really good researcher and I had good basic writing skills. So it seemed a better career path for me. And that's just kind of how I came into writing was through my love of archaeology. So uh, back in the day, my prime uh, goal was to be a magazine writer. So I hammered on that industry for years and wrote for a variety of magazines. And um, I've always enjoyed that. But again, this is kind of where I fall out of the norm. I, I've always liked the business end of writing. I love selling an idea. So, uh, you know, I love writing queries. It, it, it's, it's when I hear the writers talk, I always feel like I am like the oddball, but um, it's just who I am. So I did write for magazines, and at the same time, and I know I'm going to sound like a schizophrenic person, but I I have interests of almost everything on the planet. I was a volunteer for the American Association of Variable Star Observers, which means I got out my telescope and I counted sunspots. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I know it's like it's, so the guy who ran that program said do you want to write a book with me on solar astronomy for amateurs yeah sure I do so I actually got on the phone called the acquisitions editor at an astronomy publishing house yeah we'd like to do that book so that's how I got started writing books and less of magazines so then I did the technical book thing wrote for technical magazines started getting into web content way back, learned some HTML. I'm, I mess around with CSS. I got into WordPress. I built WordPress sites. So, you know, my writing is all over the board. And it, it always has been, and I suspect it always will be. But today I primarily write for in-person clients here in San Diego, or I write books both indie published and traditionally published. And, you know, as a hybrid author, I think it's really important that I don't just willy nilly say, I'm going to do this one indie and that one traditional. There's always a game plan for me of why I would go one route or the other. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in a thumbnail, my writing background. Yeah, which is, you know, I don't think that's very oddball. I think that probably is more typical for a, um, you know, a, a business minded nonfiction author, which you are. But I also I, I, I said to you in my email that I feel like uh, we have a lot in common because I grew up wanting to be an archaeologist as really? well. Huh? Totally. And, okay. you know, yeah, and I have that visual side, which we're talking about. And, you know, I always want and that's why my fiction, you know, I write kind of I say Lara Croft meets Dan Brown, but it could also be, you know, Lara Croft at Indiana Jones, that kind of archaeology side of things. So <laughs> I love that. It comes out in a lot of stuff, but it, it, I think it's it's a very interesting background. Of course, you do stuff in genealogy as well, and we'll, we'll come back to all these things. Um, but but let's uh, start off with the um, the visual writer book. So writers use words, obviously. So why write a book about images, and why are images so important? You know, I think it's in our DNA to be visual. 
we are primarily a visual species. And, you know, I'm sure you do this, I do this. You read articles all the time about, you know, the, the level of engagement is so much higher on Twitter if you use an image versus text. So I think it's just in our DNA that we are a visual person, but this is not new. I mean, even anthropologically, there was not a newspaper to tell me the weather report. I walked outside. I looked at the sky, the birds, the migration patterns of animals. You know, I used my eyes to give me the information I needed to survive. And even in more recent times, this is kind of staying in the how we are visual people. I look at all the symbolisms and the symbols in our lives going to go into a cemetery. I'm a cemetery geek. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. You know, that weeping willow is about sadness. And it's not just because it was a pretty thing to carve into a tombstone. It had a meaning. So I just, I, I call writers word painters because it's our job as a writer, whether fiction or nonfiction, to paint a picture for the reader. And the better picture you paint, the more the reader's going to get out of your work. So I love using images because it pushes my brain into a different direction. It pushes me deeper. Let me give you a quick example. If I'm a writer and I want to write a scene in which a pot of spaghetti explodes, and I write, this pot of spaghetti explodes, okay, you, the reader, are just going to see spaghetti on the walls. But what if I showed you, the writer, a picture of this exploded kitchen? It pushes your brain into a different place. Oh, my God, how am I going to clean this up? How am I going to get the stains off the kids' clothes? Is the landlord going to charge me $1,000 to clean up this mess? It makes us ask questions that I think don't immediately come to our mind. Uh, that's the, the value of pictures for me anyway. Mm. So, and what's interesting is, you know, you said up front you're a non-fiction writer, but the, the pot of spaghetti exploding, you know, which would generally be more in a fiction novel, you know, what one would think. So, um, and many authors talk about, you know, the idea of writer's block. So how can images, you, I guess you started to explain there, but how can images help writers get over a sort of block? Well, you know what? Uh, number one, I actually don't believe in writer's block. Uh, as someone who has made their living for 20 plus years as a freelance writer, I don't have the time or the luxury to have writer's block. <laughs> you know, I sit down, I have an assignment, I do it, period. And I think this thing called writer's block is more about not having clarity about where you want to go with your words. So, it, it, and I will tell you, even though I write nonfiction, I took a short story writing course a few months ago because I wanted to challenge my brain to think differently. And what I learned in that class was that I already, I've learned the craft over all this time, and I'm very good at, at writing visually. And I think that comes because I use pictures so often. So uh, one of the examples in the book that you referenced that I wrote was I was doing a magazine article for Astronomy Magazine on, it's called the Very Large Array. It's a radio telescopes out in New Mexico. And I could not get the beginning of that damned article. And I went back and looked at my photographs and there's wildflowers and cows and something clicked in my head and it helped me start writing my introduction to that article. And it ended up being probably one of the best introductions I have ever written in my life because I used pictures to get my brain out of the word stuff and into the visuals. Mm -hmm. And even as a nonfiction writer, I try my best to write as visually as I can. Mm. And it's interesting. So you mentioned there the wildflowers and the cows. Those are details um, that bring things alive, whether you're writing, I guess, you know, narrative nonfiction or fiction. So um, those and I agree with that, too. And often, if you can't go there, you can find things um, on the Internet around places, can't you? For example, right. you yes. could, if you'd have Googled the large array, you would have maybe found different images. But often that's the way to get more sort of real life stuff into the, into uh, writing. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I don't think I put this in the book, but when I was there, here's this, and in, in, you're out in the middle of nowhere because they don't want anything to interfere with these radio signals. And um, there was this jackrabbit that I had taken a picture of, and I thought, oh, my God, here are these huge radio telescopes out listening for space, and here's this big jackrabbit with his ears up listening to his world. And it was such a wonderful juxtaposition. It gave me just some, a great way to work that kind of imagery into the article. And, and actually, bringing that up, the kind of the listening side, which is a, almost a smaller version of the big listening, you mentioned the weeping willow um, with the graveyard before, yeah. and that image is a metaphor, I guess, as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, not to linger into the graveyard thing, but as a genealogy person, of course, you know, it's one of my favorite hangouts. Uh, you know, if you want to learn, if you want to write fiction and and you want to know about a time period, go to a graveyard. <laughs> I mean, that's the place to go. You're going to find the most incredible symbolism. And it's some of it's incredibly sad, like the lambs that are on children's graves. Or, you know, I, I just, I love those places. So I, I won't go down that road. I could talk about that forever. Oh, don't worry. Uh, everyone on this show <laughs> understands taffophiles and those of That's us who, right. yeah, those of us who love graveyards. There's quite a few listeners who send me pictures of graveyards from all around the world. So <laughs> I said we had a lot in common. <laughs> Okay, so uh, also, you know, getting more specific around images, um, one thing, again, with uh, fiction, but also nonfiction, I guess, if you're doing an interview or something, people are really important. And of course, you know, if you just try and come up with in your head, what a person looks like, you know, I might be, I might have brown hair or whatever, blue eyes, but pictures can really help us, can't they, to differentiate between different uh, humans, because they're quite hard to describe. And that is true. And, you know, if you use images, again, going back to, you know, I, I have a very large image file, as you can imagine. Even if I'm describing somebody in an interview, because I used to write uh, interviews for Astronomy Magazine, you have to, to use those images to pull something out that doesn't just say, you know, she's a middle-aged brunette. <laughs> or, or, you know, she wore a blue dress that is so flat and it does not engage the reader and it doesn't bring the reader into what you're doing. So if I get stuck in places like that, and I guess that's what I'll call writer's block is that I simply am looking for a word or a way into the story mm -hmm. because we're both telling stories basically and we're both trying to engage readers. I will go find pictures and I can either go into my own picture file. As I reference in the book, I have a cupboard full of oracle decks that I'll just go pull a card and it it's just a symbol mm. and what does that it again it forces my brain to think differently because we can get really lazy <laughs> you know and I think our brain can go to this very cliched place really quickly and when you pull out something I, I, I was working on a scene because I do dabble in fiction Nobody knows that much about it, but because it's my secret thing. Um, I was writing something about a setting in New Mexico, and I drew this card that was an ocean. And I thought, oh, what the hell does this have to do with my New Mexico thing? And I realized, well, what does an ocean mean to me? It, it can be terrifying. It can be exciting. It can be refreshing. So just what does that symbol mean to me personally? Then I can take it into my story, mm. whether fiction or nonfiction. Mm. So you mentioned Oracle decks there, and in my head I thought you meant an Oracle database, like a... a no, no, like, like an Oracle, like... Like a, a tarot card type a tarot, thing. A tarot card, or a... they're also called Oracle decks, or... I don't really care what it is, mm. if it's imagery that makes me think differently that's all I care about. Yeah, and so I have, uh, obviously I have a load of photos too, but I generally have them electronically. And then the only physical books I buy these days are books of images. So I have one on the apocalypse, which I love because I, <laughs> I love writing about the apocalypse. But, um, you know, I have, I've got, I bought one recently called the Atlas of Obscure Places, um, which I really love and lots of graveyards and skulls and things like that. But, uh -huh. you know, the, the books, 
books I find, picture books, are the thing that is almost necessary to have physically, um, which sounds similar to your cards. Yes, it is very much. And in fact, you know, because, you know, I am very, my love of history is very American centric. It's just where my interest goes. And sometimes I feel like I need something way out of my, my comfort level. So I just ordered a limited edition tarot deck called, and it's the Tarot of Prague. Ah. And it's all Prague based imagery. And I thought, that's good because that's going to really force me. I am always looking for ways to force myself to think differently. Mm. And also, I guess it's a way of um, seeing. So I was in Prague at, uh, over New Year. So, you know, it's a place that I love and it's been in my books, um, a great place and very Eastern European type of thing. But, you know, when I say Eastern European, a lot of people might not know what that means. But, you know, the pictures will help you get into that that space I guess but it's I, I think some people struggle with you know if you're walking around a graveyard you're not just taking a picture of everything are you so how do you train your brain to pick out the stuff that's interesting well you know I have I guess this is a double-edged sword is that I, I have so many interests I'll never be able to write about them all so uh, I have to force myself to focus because I do love kind of the Everything. I love everything. Um, I typically will go with a goal, actually. Mm. You know, am I looking for symbols? Am I looking for epitaphs? You know, am I looking for family groups? I really do go with with some idea of what I, I'm looking for. Mm. And, you know, for me, it's almost always symbols. Because I want... I have a friend who actually wrote a book about cemetery research. And... Um, I love it because I can go look up all the symbols I'm photographing to see what what what's the origin. And it's amazing to me. I actually was in Colorado. I love to travel, as you can tell. I was in Colorado going down some back road somewhere, and I saw this, this tombstone factory. And I thought, oh, my God, this is so cool. I pulled in, and I went into the office, and I said, I know you're going to think this is nuts, but... Could you give me a tour through this tombstone factory? They were they were wonderful. They showed me how they did everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> you would have loved that place. But yeah. uh, just the symbolism. And today, you know, people will choose symbols because they like the picture. And traditionally, you know, people did choose symbols because they actually had a meaning. Mm. I probably didn't answer your question. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think I think why I guess why I'm asking is now a lot of the images we look for. Uh, so the latest book, uh, my book that came out today, in fact, Destroyer of Worlds, which is um, thank you, set in India. So I've been to India a couple of times, but there were um, Mumbai, for example, where uh, a, quite a bit of the book is set. I've never been to Mumbai, so I was um, looking on Flickr and on Pinterest, and I guess just googling in general and i find that obviously the quality of the images you get back on google image search are based around the quality of your questions because if you just put mumbai that's just going to be ridiculous so you have to um go a bit deeper uh you know for example the towers of silence so a place name is one thing but again if you had put mumbai graveyard that wouldn't have been enough so um are, do you do sort of image searches online as well as physically and and how do you search and it's a funny question but i do find that some people just don't have that ability to 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 find you know to kind of come in at an angle to find the right um to find the right images no and i do use i use google as well i and maybe this is just my my research background is i like to create google search strings by using you know quotes and pluses and minuses so i've gotten very good at knowing how to create a search string on mm. google and it can be very complex because Google can handle a lot of, it's like a math operator. Google can handle a very long string, query string. So that is something I do. But I also, because a lot of my stuff is, is U.S. history, uh, I go to USA.gov and almost everything that I find there imagery is copyright free because it is paid for by we the people. Mm. So I like going there. Um, 
I also, like you, use Flickr with Creative Commons, and but I've also recently stumbled onto Pixabay, hmm. and uh, they have very, very good images, uh, really high quality, but you're right, you really have to ask for the right thing or you just get all this crazy stuff. Could you give uh, us an example of, of one of your string searches? I, well, one, I'm just going to give you a genealogy one because it's easier. Mm. Okay. Quote, John Smith, close quote, plus sign, Ohio, minus sign, Kentucky, plus sign. I mean, that is kind of a search string is I'm saying I want you to find me John Smith stuff in Ohio, but I don't want you to bring me back anything from Kentucky. And sometimes I'll also say, and I only want you to pull it from Ancestry.com. I only want you to pull it from this website because you can you can set up all those operators in Google and it works very well. Mm. So if you want Prague, you know, it, it's just so easy depending on what you want to set up that string of search operators. And it's just like doing an algebra equation. It's it's, it's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> Which some people, uh, most people, don't find that easy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's very logical to me. So, mm. uh, and I think, Google I think has they have a very good help thing about their search operators. Yeah, and I I think this will become more and more important over time because uh, this like um, you know my my mom is a classic example of of someone who just is still afraid of computers. You know, in her sort of in her late sixties, she's never got into computers. So when she searches, she just doesn't search in the way that we would, and it, it kind of you know so I. I that's why I was asking these questions because I know that some people haven't really grasped that you have to get to this deeper level and that that deeper deeper level can also bring serendipity so so someone said to me it was a classic they said but if you're not going around physical libraries looking for these things how will serendipity happen um, or synchronicity or whatever you want to call it and I'm like seriously have you been on the internet I mean <laughs> you know if I type in you know whatever you type into Google and then you click the image um, you know button what's going to come up a whole load of things that you weren't expecting right isn't that just as serendipitous as it, it is wonderful yeah it's it's wondering the stacks <laughs> well and plus google has gotten very smart at understanding what you're looking for and it also will use your past searches to have a sense of what you're looking for hmm. so uh, you know because it knows i look up I, i'm writing two genealogy books right now for a traditional publisher it knows I look for genealogy a lot, so it tends to bring genealogy stuff up to the top mm. because it knows my search history. So uh, what do you think about Pinterest for, for either research or for saving images? You know, I love it, and I am the worst person on the planet. As I, I got into photography as a teenager and have been there ever since. As somebody who is so visual, I am so vilely bad at Pinterest and Instagram I just, uh, honestly, I don't know how to find more time in my day. <laughs> I, that, that's what it comes down to. And I, I think I need to stop building websites because I maintain a genealogy site. I maintain a site that my sister and I do to kind of chronicle our historic travels. And I just started a site about a month ago to put some of my, I I'm, have become an avid iPhoneographer. Uh, to put my iPhone imagery on. So maybe if I'd stop building websites, I'd have more time <laughs> to put stuff out on Pinterest or Instagram. I think Pinterest is great. I go there um, primarily looking for good vegetarian recipes. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And um, well, I, I do a Pinterest board for every fiction book I, I do. I know you do. Now, how do you have time to do that? Well, primarily I actually do it as I right so for example i um one of the one of the bad sort of characters in destroyer of worlds is is an agori uh sadhu which are, you know a kind of holy man but they're these crazy guys who live in um graveyards and they cover themselves with ash and they drink blood from skulls and they, they're just a brilliant bad guy they're actually real so uh you know and i went looking for for some kind of crazy imagery of agori and uh and 
before I'd even written the scenes. So for me, it's actually a research process. So my Pinterest boards are completed, you know, way before the book comes out. Um, and often they're called the wrong name because I call the Pinterest board the, the kind of working title of the book before oh. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so I kind of gather the images as I write, and then when I'm writing the the scene with the agori, I'll I'll have the images up on Pinterest in front of me, and also it just means it's very easy to share socially for for marketing. I have not found a way to crack the code of Pinterest for nonfiction, mm. and I know that there probably is, but I have not found my way through that. Uh, I just haven't. I think a lot of a lot of that is quotes as well, isn't it? Which yes. you know, let's face it, we're talking about imagery, and although quotes are great, you know, quotes on images are great. There's quite a lot of work involved in creating those, isn't there? <laughs> well, there is, and you know, I don't know. I guess what I could do, and my sister is start. My sister and I do two kind of big history road trips a year. Uh, she started putting up pictures from our trips. But um, that's probably where I would tend to go is travel photos mm. that generally have nothing to do with what I'm doing. But I'm, I actually just started writing an indie book on taking road trips. I, my sister and I, we calculated we have driven about 50,000 miles over the course of time. And uh, oh, my God. So we do have a lot to say about road trips. <laughs> So also, and you mentioned there about sharing your photos on websites. So what about the importance of using image tags for those photos for SEO reasons? It's, it's really important. And when I first started doing web content, I really did get into the whole SEO thing. And today, you know, if you have word, if you have a WordPress site, especially there are plugins, SEO plugins. And if you forget to do the image tags, little dings come up to remind you, you know, you didn't tag this image correctly or you didn't tag it at all. So uh, I do that. I just use plugins on my WordPress site and it reminds me if I forget. Mm, and when we say that, if people don't understand, it would literally be, you know, like the Weeping Willow, the image tag would be Weeping Willow Graveyard. Well, I would go beyond that. I would do Weeping Willow, Graveyard, Cemetery, um, Sadness. I would actually put in more words than just the few. Okay. Oh, no, that's that's good to know. I must say then I'm pretty basic. But, you know, it, I think, you know, you're saying you you don't share them necessarily on Pinterest, but you share your photos on websites. So, on web yeah, it's just yeah. A, a different way of doing it. Yeah. And I do, I've really kind of, I've started thinking about Instagram because I I am so image driven. Again, for me, it's just a time issue. And I don't know what, I don't know what else to juggle <laughs> or, to re, or to remove from the list. Yeah, exactly. And as you said, you, you much prefer doing road trips. And I'm the same. I'm a total research and travel junkie. And I wondered, um, you know, maybe you could give us a glimpse into this new book. But how do you decide what trips to do? Because obviously you can't do everything. Um, and, and how do you follow your curiosity in, in that way? What do you, how do you decide what to do next? Well, in terms of books, you know, as I said, right now I'm doing two for a traditional publishing. So that's driving me until mid-July when they're both due. And then I'll do a trip after that just to, to decompress because I've been on a really tight schedule. Uh, for me on these road trips, it's like, oh, okay, what do I feel like seeing now? Well, I, I feel like going to Montana and then maybe to Canada. So I'll get out the maps and I use paper maps for this part. And it's like, oh, okay, what do I want to see along the way? And, you know, I, I will research every step of the way because I don't want to miss anything. Mm. And I end up making a travel notebook that have all the places I want to stop, all the things I want to see, what hours they're open, what days they're closed. And, and I do it. It's like a big travel notebook I make for all of my trips. And um, that's kind of what I do. It's like, what do I feel like seeing on this trip? Mm. And like right now, honestly, I'm kind of thinking about I want to go to Sacramento because as long as I've lived in California, I've never gone to Gold Rush country. And I want to see 
you know, the whole area of where the California gold rush took place. So I think that's probably going to be my next trip. Mm. And then along the way, things might catch your eye that you weren't expecting. Absolutely. And those are the best, you know. I, I I was laughing because yesterday I was actually working on this book and I wrote about as much as I plan, there have been many times I've sped by some road sign t- and and turned around on a highway at miles out of my way because I, I missed an exit and I saw a sign that's like, oh, wow, that looks interesting. I need to go back and see what that is. And, you know, as writers... You have to be a curious person. I mean, you have to have a huge level of curiosity. I mean, don't you, you see things and your brain says, oh, like what happened here? Who are those people? Why are they doing that? And I, you know, as I am an introvert and I have about a two hour max of being around people and then I have to go away and be by myself. But I am so curious when I go to places I will ask those poor people every question I can think of <laughs> because I really want to, I it's not it's not you know for nothing I have a deep curiosity to understand why are you here what are you doing what happened here mm. I'll and, ask so many questions and I think that uh, that trusting your curiosity is something that people have to you know you have to do as a writer it's so important for fiction as well you i don't think you can engineer that you know like we mentioned graveyards and again i do quite often mention graveyards and some people love it and some people are not interested at all but when you have to lean into who you are and other people will be attracted to that won't they you just have to trust that other people are interested in that you know i think i think you've hit on something really important as an author especially when you're starting You know, I think you get into people who try and follow trends and, you know, will try and, you know, scam Google for this, that, or the other, or whatever. And I think as we age, maybe not chronologically, but age as authors and writers, we learn that we have to let the story evolve and we follow where it takes us. And... And I do this in my nonfiction books. I This one book I'm writing right now, the genealogy one, I wrote some stuff yesterday. It's like, I don't know why I went that way, <laughs> but I know it, it was right. And you just have to let it happen and not try and force it. Then I think you, you get into very stilted, boring writing. Yeah, and, and if you're not still curious, then kind of what's the point, you know? <laughs> I know. What, I mean, really, what is the point? <laughs> So, you know, uh, I, I just, I think you really do have to follow your instincts. And, you know, I was in, San Diego has, um, San Diego is called the birthplace of, of California. And I, you've been here, I think. Yeah, huh? yeah. My mom lived in San Diego for years. So. Uh, okay. So, um, very large Hispanic population. And I was in San Diego's old town over the weekend working on a, another project and a, a young girl was down there doing a book signing. And, you know, I, I hate book signings. And <laughs> so too. I see an author doing it. I always stop and talk to them because I, I just, they're so miserable. I hate them. <laughs> so I started talking to her and her family was actually in San Diego with Father Sarah in the first mission in California. So her family goes back in California history 400 years. And it was so interesting, 300 years. So it's like, could you walk away without asking her 100 questions? Of course I couldn't. (laughs) You know, tell me more about your family. How did this happen? And I think that's just part of being a writer, Mm -hmm. is you you follow that. You follow that curiosity. Yeah. You also do uh, multimedia courses, and like you said, you do freelance writing. You do all different types of hybrid publishing. You're, you know, you just have so many things going on in your business. It's very exciting. Um, so I wonder if you could kind of explain what are the various things that make up your your author business, so that people get a sense of that. Sure, it, 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 I am a hybrid author, and I do. Would, I'd like to just say this, you know, briefly. There are times it's very wise to go to a traditional route. Very t- other, it's very wise to go the injury route. 
I, several months ago, I realized nobody had ever done a San Diego coloring book. And we are like the, you know, the tourist capital of, of the West. And so I started amassing photos and having them converted to, to coloring book images. And I was going to indie publish it. And then I realized there's a place here in, in San Diego that does book distribution all over Southern California, and they have their foot in every tourist door in this city. And it would take me months to do that. Mm -hmm. So I met with them and signed a contract that they're actually going to publish the coloring book. I could, this is one of those things I wanted to talk about. I could have done that independently. Mm. I would never have had the level of distribution that they have. So for me, it was much wiser to go the, the traditional route on that book. But on the road trip, I'm definitely into doing the indie. I'm, I'm writing the book, you know, right now it's called, in my head, it's called The Art of the Road Trip. That's, that's going to definitely be an indie book. But anyway, to get back to your question, I almost always have a local client of some kind. I have a business client. Uh, in fact, I had dinner with him last night. Uh, that I'm I'm actually writing his biography, and uh, I have done ghostwriting projects. I don't like ghostwriting, and I don't think I'll do another one. But I like working with this particular local client, so I do try and do that. I write my indie books, my traditional books. I've done courses on Udemy, on writing, and on Evernote. And I've developed seven courses for Family Tree University on genealogy stuff. And I also license books in different languages. So the biggest mistake an author can, can make is to rely on one income source. That is the kiss of death. I learned that very early in my career. I had one client and it supported me. And one day it was gone. Mm -hmm. And my income was gone. So never again would I ever do that. And that's why, you know, people want to quit their day job. And, you know, I had a regular job and I balanced, it was like the seesaw. When the time came that I couldn't keep up with the freelance work without working 24 seven, I knew it was time to quit. But then, you know, after that one incident, I knew that I had to broaden my base as a freelancer, uh, you know, especially doing nonfiction. But for me, you know, the good the good thing is too. I can also do speaking. I've done speaking on genealogy. I get invitations to travel to do genealogy talks because that's the field I'm most known in. There are so many opportunities for authors, and I think that we get really tunneled into books, and we forget there's so many other ways to go. Mm -hmm. um, I. I curate two Flipboard magazines because I love how many things, how many times have I said I love? Well, I do. <laughs> you know, that's me. Uh, I really love curation and sharing what I've learned. So I have a Flipboard magazine called Writer's Life. And I have another one called History of, Photography, History of Travel Photography. It is my, I call it my trifecta of happiness. Um, so, you know, I'm busy all the time and it makes me happy to be busy all the time. Yeah, I think the only people who need balance, like work-life balance, are people who are unhappy with their work and therefore they need that balance because they're unhappy in one side. But I'm like you, it's like I enjoy all of their stuff. Uh, well, so do. it's all fun. <laughs> well, plus, you know, for me, relax, you know, relaxation is either going out with my camera or the iPhone Mm -hmm. and doing shots uh, around town because I live in a very beautiful place or sitting with the iPad and editing photos. I love doing that too. So, you know, the things I love happily merge with the things I make money with. Mm. And I, I would say that, you know, that I feel really blessed in that because I do love all the things I do. But you've created that life, haven't you? That's the yeah. that's the point. You've actually made you've zeroed in on what you love and leaned into those things, and then you've learned how to make money still doing things you love. I do, and you know, I still build WordPress sites for clients. <laughs> you know, it's 
And honestly, people, you know, I think you have to love technology. And um, people don't believe this, but I promise you this is the truth. In May of this year, I will have been online for 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. I got on CompuServe in May of 1986. And so, you know, technology is in my blood. I, I love doing it. And people don't understand that when I, I say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on a WordPress site and they'll say, oh, that sounds horrible. And I'll say, you know, it is so relaxing for me to sit and work on a website. It is one of my, it's like downtime. It's so easy and I like it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what I do. And I'm happy with the life I've created. That's fantastic. So where can people find you and all your books and courses and everything online? Well, I'm on Amazon. And uh, like you, I, I got very smart uh, several months ago. You, you beat me by years. And I stopped being primarily on Amazon. So I'm pretty much everywhere. And I, I use uh, draft to digital to get my books out into other places. But Nancy Hendrickson is, nancyhendrickson.com is my primary website. Um, Frontier Traveler is the site that my sister and I have, and we are very lazy about it, but you know, time, time, time. And The Reconnected Life is just my, my photo site just for me. But now, oh my gosh, it's not just for me, is it? <laughs> now I've said the reconnectedlife.com. It's where I put up some of my iPhone stuff. And it's just because I want to. Fantastic. Well, thanks yeah. so much for your time, Nancy. That was great.